Philadelphia, Union, San Jose, or DC, Los Angeles, Galaxy, Beach Pass, Colorado Rapids, Vancouver Whitecaps, Seattle Sounders, Montreal Impact, Bosch USA, New York Red Bulls, Pitch Pass, your all access credential to the people that matter in MLS. Here's your host, Greg Roach. Hello, welcome to Pitch Pass. Did you download last week's episode? It was really good. I really enjoyed talking with Kyle Martino. And one of the things we touched on was uh, the LA Galaxy, the Landon Donovan, the Omar Gonzalez situation. I figured let's go a little bit deeper into a team that I think has to be considered the front runner for this year's MLS Cup. I don't care about the standings. You go back to back and you are still hanging in there doing your business in August. You're probably going to be the front runner going into this year's MLS playoffs. First, though, let's encourage you to go to PitchPass.com. That's where you're going to see everything related to the show. We are actually on Google Currents now. If you don't know what Google Currents is, that's fine. Just know that we are there. It's a beautiful layout for everything that you need at PitchPass.com. It's available through Google Currents. So uh, try that as well, in addition to your subscribing through iTunes or however else you get the show. Thank you very much. Please spread the word. So let's talk some Galaxy with the LA Galaxy Insider. That would be Adam Serrano, and he joins us right now on Pitch Pass. Adam, it's a little hard to track you down. You're a very busy man. LA Galaxy Insider got you uh, always looking for scoops, I would imagine. Yeah, that's the life I live. (laughs) I thought maybe you might have been avoiding my calls because you weren't really feeling like you wanted to tap dance at all today. No, no, no. Tap dancing is fun. It's what I do for a living. Oh, great. Well, then let's tap dance around the Landon Donovan news that Grant Wall broke earlier today as we record. Um, Obviously, it's not official, and uh, since you are with the Galaxy, you probably can't confirm it. Can you? It depends on... I haven't heard anything specific yet, and there's a press conference tomorrow, but... um... So as of this evening, when we uh, release this podcast, you cannot confirm anything, can you? No. <laughs> well, then let's talk in hypotheticals. All right, Adam? All right. We talked with Kyle Martino last week, and, and the Galaxy were a main subject of our conversation. We talked to Omar Gonzalez, and we talked to Landon Donovan, and, and I kind of was curious or skeptical about a market for a 32-year-old American soccer player overseas. Uh, if everything that comes to fruition happens and he ends up staying with the Galaxy, uh, was there a market for Landon Donovan overseas? I mean, I'd like to think that there was. I mean, you know, he was a... He is a quality player. He's the best American player there's ever been. Uh, he mentioned that he had lots of intriguing offers on the table. I think that there are teams that would have wanted him to be part of their club, you know, in Europe and in Latin America where he's very popular. So I think that there would have been legitimate options for him. I just asked the question because it's not a matter of a 28-year-old going or even the Clint Dempsey thing where he is coming back into the league. This is a this is a guy who, this is a, an age, I should say, not a guy, but this is an age where most they don't really go into high-level leagues just because the teams think to themselves, well, all right, I, I want a guy I'm going to have for four years. This guy could be past it in a year and a half from now. And then when you factor in the, that he's American and maybe that doesn't make him as attractive or sexy as some other signings that they could bring in. And that's kind of why I thought to myself, well, maybe maybe there isn't much of a market for him. I really disagree with that. Okay. You know, I think that he's the type of player who is – He's a good player. He's a very quality player. And I think that, you know, people are going to want a guy of his caliber. And as you've seen over the last month or so, he's really turned it on. And he's been playing some of the best soccer he's ever played. So I think, you know, he's, he was always going to have people interested. Let me ask you about what we are thinking is going to happen in the next few days and that'll be speculation and rumors as to as to what he will be making yearly moving forward um you spent a lot of time with him is he the kind of guy that it would be important to maybe eclipse or at least get into the same stratosphere as clint dempsey is i you know that's really something where you know you think about the person and what they're interested in i think for Landon, the most important thing is, you know, being happy, being content in where he is. Do I think that maybe that potentially came up? 
Possibly. I think that he certainly deserves it. I think that if I was a GM, if I was if I was Landon's agent, you know, I would say that that kind of player should receive more money. He should be the highest paid player in the league. He is the best American player to ever play the game. So it's certainly deserving of that high level, high level deal. Whether or not it happens, you know, I think we'll find all that out in uh, the days and hours to come. I completely agree with you in the sense that he should be, at the very least, the highest paid American player in the league. And it just so happens the highest paid American player in the league is an American right now. So, or the highest paid player in the league is an American right now. Um, but give us give us some reasons why you feel that way. Well, I mean, the resume of Lyndon Donovan speaks for itself. I mean, he is closing in on Jeff Cunningham's all-time and most goal scoring record. He is still a vital piece of the U.S. national team. No matter what, you know, this uh, temporary Jurgen Klinsmann issue would lead you to believe, you know, he is a vital player, and he's a player that can take over a game at any moment. You know, lots made of players like Graham Zussi, you know, who have similar skills, but Landon Donovan has that experience. He's able to, you know, link up with other players. I think his relationship, his partnership with Robbie Keane is phenomenal. And I think when you put those two players together, they're the best combination in MLS, period. I mean, you can make arguments about certain other guys that they are just as effective, but Landon Donovan and Robbie Keane are incredibly important to their team. They've only lost twice when they've played against each other, and they've only gotten to play forward up top together a handful of times. And LA has been competitive or won most of those matches. So I think he is worth it in the sense that he can change the game. He is still an Donovan, so he's still a draw market-wise. So I think he certainly deserves to be up in that stratosphere. I also would add that he... Uh... And I, I'm sure nobody put nobody in front office has put much stock in this, but as a as a fan, he's been in the league the entire time. He he didn't go. He he had chances to go overseas. He he chose to stay, and well, I, I think mean, that's, that's not worth something. Technically true. No, he he's gone overseas on on loans, and he's played as as a youngster overseas. I guess my point is. Uh, if if all things are being equal and we can have an argument about a who's the better player, Clint Dempsey or Landon Donovan, if we're having that discussion, then they're both in the conversation. And and to me, I put more stock in the guy that's been that's invested a lot of time in this league. And that to me, that's Landon Donovan. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's why I've always been. You know, that that argument has always gone on. It's Pepsi or Coke. You know, it's, and it's anything. And it's this something where I think that Landon Donovan has always had that kind of edge. Yes, Clint Dempsey went abroad. Yes, he was phenomenal for Fulham, and he did well for Tottenham last year. He took the risk of going abroad, and people have hit back at Landon for doing that. But, you know, I mean, players are different. They're different people. And I think that as fans, sometimes, you know, you lose that concept of a athlete as a real person. And, you know, Landon has taken the time he's invested himself in growing U.S. soccer. Yes, he feels, you know, like this is the best place for him in Southern California as a person, but he's invested that time and he's invested, you know, his his livelihood. And I think that that, that really says something to me, not just as a reporter not just as somebody that watches soccer, but just as a human being, I think. And that's pretty that's pretty meaningful. Do you think that he, and I think he did, but do you think that he had the juice to force a transfer to Everton uh, a few years ago when he when he had to run there? And he, he, he just, he you could tell that he really enjoyed his time over there. You could tell that he really enjoyed uh, being out of the spotlight or the glare of being the face of American soccer. Do you think he had the juice to, to force a transfer? I think that if he could have won, if he really wanted it, I think they could have gotten done. Because, as we mentioned, you know, Lennon has done plenty for this yeah. country. But, you know, I think that if he really would have, wanted, would have wanted to repay that, I think that would have been something. And I think, in my opinion, it's something you have to consider, right? I mean, sometimes that happens in professional sports where you 
have a player who's done well, but they kind of want to they want to make a move and they want to do something else. So if that had actually happened, I think that I think it could have. But I mean, hypothetical situations yeah. are always murky. We talked about the money situation. You brought up the Jeff Cunningham uh, goal scoring record, and uh, you actually did a, a nice little write up. Uh, for on Landon Donovan about the goal scoring record, what how important is that to him um, as far as as far as goals for the league and as far as personal goals? I mean, he said it himself that you know he doesn't, he's not gonna be mentioning that on his deathbed that he broke the game off all time <laughs> goal scoring record. But you know that aside, it's important to him. But I think Landon is has always been about collective goals as opposed to individual goals. And I think that's why it's so important for him to be the winningest player of all time in MLS history. And that would mean winning a sixth MLS Cup, something that no MLS, no MLS player has ever done. So I think that would be huge for him to really cement himself as the all-time winner, I think. Do I think that, that it's important for him to have those goals? Yes. Do I think he'll have it? Definitely. I think he'll have it before the end of this season. You know, and I think as we move on, and you know, whatever, I know Grant has reported it's a multi-year deal, so that's going to give him a chance to also catch Steve Ralston for the all-time assist lead, too. So you could have, by the time Lionel Donovan's done hanging up, he could have the most MLS Cups, the most goals, and the most assists. You, you look at that, that's the best player ever produced. No more arguments. It's over. Yeah, and I think as long as the league stays the way that it currently is, which is more of a seller's league than a buyer's league, these records, I don't want to say they're unbreakable, but you know, you get a young player, Landon's, uh, when Landon broke through, he probably will go overseas at some point, uh, or you get one of the older players coming in as a DP. My point is, it's very unlikely that we will see in the near future anybody who will threaten some of these records. Yeah, I think that these are, I think it would have to be some people that are already in the league, you know, maybe like a, a Dwayne Di Rosario or something. But I think these are records that Blend can have. I think that would really cement that legacy of him being the next best U.S. player. I mean, there could be a player who comes down the road who, you know, chooses to stay in MLS. I mean, I think that might be the key here with this talk of Blend and coming, to staying with the talk of, with David, with a uh, Ken Dempsey staying, guys like Clarence Goodson, you know, people are coming back to MLS, yeah. and I think that makes a real statement about where this league is heading, in that it's trying to kind of fortify itself. You know, Concacaf Champions League always comes around. We talk about how the MLS teams can't compete with Mexican squads because of the money or the value, and I think that that's kind of changing a little bit. MLS is trying to get a little bit more fierce. And, you know, keep some of these guys at home because you think about it, you know, people talk about the Swedish league or the Norwegian league and we, you know, we kind of glorify because it's in Europe. But for a player to stay home, those are the kind of guys you need to keep. Yeah. If your guy is going to Manchester United, then he's going to Manchester United or Real Madrid, but your guy is going to Helsingborgs or those type of places, those are the guys you need to keep and help really sort of expand the game in the United States. If the rumors of the multi-year deal are true, uh, you know we saw Landon step away from the game. Um, we've we've also read a lot of Landon over the years. He's probably the most dissected American player that we've ever had, um, saying that you know he does have a lot of outside interest. If this is a multi-year deal, could you see this being the last deal that Landon Do Landon Donovan signs? You know, I think it, it all just depends on how long this is for. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, he is getting up there in age. You know, we don't know how many caps he's going to have for the U.S. national team. You know, no doubt he'll be in Brazil unless something uh, grave happens. So he has that going for him. I think that, you know, it, it could potentially be that. It could be that last deal. And if it is, you know, I think he's, if that's true, I, I'd, I'd assume that he'd be rewarded like a player of his stature, of his caliber. Let's pull out the lens and talk uh, Galaxy stuff. Um, now with Landon Donovan possibly signing a multi-year deal, Omar Gonzalez locked in as a designated player. Uh, Robbie Keane still on the payroll as a designated player. 
Does this push the Galaxy and maybe say some other bigger clubs like Sounders and and New York Red Bulls, uh, but specifically Galaxy since you cover them, does this push them to want to to add another designated player slot? I mean, I think that those types of deals, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the if the league tried to move that way. You know, you've seen a lot of things talking about that. You know, I'm on soccer dot com. You've seen people kind of analyze whether or not that would be an option. And I think it's something seriously that you have to consider. I don't. I think that your smaller market teams might feel the pinch a little bit. You don't really see a Columbus crew adding a fourth designated player, but you might. Uh, you know, San Jose Earthquakes, for example. But I think that if this league is ever going to expand and it's ever going to become one of the top, 20 or 10 leagues in the world and whatever Don Garber said recently by 2020 or whatever, I think that it needs to have that kind of infusion. You need to have, be able to spend more money for the better player. And in an interview that Russo Arena did with the LA Times, he talked about, you know, what it meant for Omar Gonzalez to sign his third designee to be the third designated player for the Galaxy and said, you know, the problem with the American player has never been motivation. It's been incentive. I mean, you talk about why kids go to play baseball as opposed to go play soccer. You know, you have that kind of incentive value, but now we're rewarding those American players who are good. And really, it tells people you can kind of make a career in soccer. And I think that's a, a major step forward. And that's something that I think will be helped by this more infusion of cash, I think, into the league, which is just great for U.S. soccer and for the country as a whole. You made a uh, you, you mentioned uh, after the last match versus Vancouver Whitecaps that, in your opinion, this is probably the lineup that we're going to see from the Galaxy moving forward without you know international call-ups and things like that. Why, why this lineup do you feel this is the one that they're going to go to battle with for the rest of the season? Well, I think that first off, you know, you have to mention Jaime Pinedo. I think that he's certainly done his job to win, you know, for the San Jose Earthquakes match. I think, barring anything, there's no reason this guy should not be starting every game for the Galaxy, barring, you know, international call up or injury, because he has performed so well. He's looked so confident, so comfortable in net, you know. He's displayed a willingness to come off his line and really just control his box, which is not something you really saw earlier in the season from, you know, Carlo Cuccini or Brian Rowe. You know, they were a little tentative at times, but, you know, Panetta has really done well. And also, you look up the field. You know, a lot's been made about the back four of Sean Franklin, Omar Gonzalez, A.J. Lagarza, and uh, Todd Donovan, something that LA has used predominantly for the last three seasons. and But every single time there's been a, a factor that has kind of changed that, I'm talking about Leonardo. You know, Bruce Arena has really favored the Brazilian center back. He has had his foibles, but he has that high profile. He looks like a center back. He's a big, hulking guy. He's able to pass the ball a little bit better. And I think that as long as he stays healthy, I think he's the top choice for Bruce Arena if he had all his guys available. So you put him with Omar Gonzalez and you have a tandem that can real, really deal with, you know, a San Jose Earthquakes backline. It can deal with faster players like a Clint Dempsey, you know. I think you're putting yourself at more of an advantage in those kind of battles. And then you look up the field, Hector Jimenez has done very well. You know, Marcelo and Janino have done fantastic. Uh, Giassi is artist is another interesting one because he has been a forward, but he has that kind of breakneck speed that seems natural for a wide player. And he's kind of taken that sort of Mike McGee role where he's a forward, but he's been put out wide to try to create chances. And I think that Arena feels that if this kid can hit one or two of those chances that he makes, you know, he typically gets about seven, eight shots on game. If he can hit one, you know, L.A.'s in a good group because up top you have Robbie Keenan and Donovan, yeah. the best forwards in MLS. So I think with this with this group, I think they're going to be pretty competitive going forward. And so then you feel, I guess, uh, Jose Villarreal and uh, Jack McBean are 
Champions League or like how do they factor just you know offensive firepower off the bench moving forward? I think so. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna have to see a change in lineup just starting uh, next week against the Rapids because you're gonna have international call ups. I'm sure you know Panetta's already been called up, and I'm sure that Keane and Donovan will be called up for their matches. Omar Gonzalez as well. So you're going to already have some shuffling, and that's where guys can fill in. I think I had a conversation with Sean Franklin about, you know, moving to right midfield where Bruce just kind of wanted to put him. And he's talked about just being available, being a depth player, and I think that's where a guy like Jose Villarreal and uh, Jack McBean slide in because when you have players playing as well as, as Keenan Donovan, you're going to have to look for other options. And, you know, like Bean and Villarreal don't have that kind of versatility where they can play in the midfield like a Jossie's artist can. So they're going to have to find their opportunities, I think, in Champions League. I think if LA gets a kind of definitive victory against uh, Metapon in their next match at home, I think they can start to kind of give some time to some reserve players and not have to lean on their starters as much, which will help them going into the playoff race. But I expect Bruce Arena to have a fair bit of rotation, you know, Robbie Rogers is injured. I think that they'll rotate the roster enough and give them enough minutes to guys so they'll be fresh and ready for the, the playoff chase. So you mentioned international call-ups. Uh, I read your, your piece on uh, A.J. De La Garza and uh, coming out and saying that he's going to play for Guam. Um, two things about that. First, it didn't feel like a definitive, I'm playing for Guam. He definitely left that door open to come back for the national team. Is Guam just happy to have someone of his caliber who is saying he may want to play, or could this be a problem down the road? I mean, I think Guam should be happy that somebody like Adrian Lagarde is willing to play, you know, for that team. He has Guamanian roots. Uh, I mean, in my opinion, I've held this idea for a long time, so... uh, you know, you can't say it's a uh, because I'm the LA Galaxy insider, but I really think that AJ Lagarza is one of the smartest defenders in MLS. He knows his positioning is usually superb. He doesn't have the size, but he knows how to counteract that and kind of use his, you know, his stature to his advantage. So I think that internationally, you know, he's typically been used more as a right back, but you know, he is he has become a very fine center back that is among the top in MLS, but I think that with internationally going over to a place like Guam, you know, they're not in any real tournaments and they're in a tournament in October, but LA is in the playoff chase. That's not really going to happen. So I think this is more of a thing where it's down the line. And, and I mean, Dele Garza knows that if he has a good playoff, if LA win another MLS cup, then he's going to be in the conversation for a January camp. And then he can go on from there. I think, He's actually made this statement before last year when he was uh, put on a provisional roster for a AFC Challenge Cup, I believe it was. So I think that he's leaving his options open. He's not closing any doors. He's had a conversation with Jurgen Klinsmann about it. I think that he's being smart. I think he wants to play internationally. So if the U.S. doesn't come calling, he can go over to Guam. And, you know, knowing him the way I do, I think he likes that kind of David versus Goliath idea, so he'll be able to try to help lead the Guamanians to maybe, you know, uh, Asian Cup or whatever they can qualify for. And something I was thinking about as I was reading the piece, and I don't know if this happens, and I don't know if you can even shed light on it, but when I, when, if I'm a head coach of an MLS team and I, I look at a guy, and obviously you can't keep him from pursuing international dreams or aspirations, but I think to myself, Guam, okay, um, is that a conversation he needs to have with Bruce before he, he makes a definitive statement saying, I'm, I'm going to be available, make myself available to play for a country that is you know, a minnow uh, to, to be kind on the world stage and also so far away? Yeah, you know, I think that it has to be meaningful games. It needs to be. It's not just any game against the, the Solomon Islands that he's going to get called up for. It has to be a FIFA date like any other player. It has to be a real tournament. I think that I think that De La Garza has, you know, he knows. He knows that you'd have to, for that long flight, you'd have to be willing to, to not only go there, but you don't want to just go there for, for no reason, which could put you in bad setting for your club. So he's been around long enough that he would understand that. And I think that 
if he were to go to Guam, it would need to be for, you know, a potential Asia Cup match, you know, World Cup qualifiers, uh, that sort of sort, unless the season is already over. So I think that they're going to be very smart with that. They know how long that is. It's a huge travel commitment. It's going to cause, it might cause some problems. So I think, you know, they have to be smart with him. And I think AJ knows that as well. Galaxy have a huge match coming up after this match, um, as far as the league is concerned, against Colorado Rapids. But you can't, this isn't one of those things where, oh, they could be forgiven for looking ahead because California Classico is this weekend for, for the Galaxy. Is, is, this the, is this the derby that they look forward to? Um, and I don't want to say no disrespect to Chivas USA, but me asking the question means disrespect for Chivas. Is this the, 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 the derby, the Classico that, that they have circled on their calendar? 100%. This is, the, this is the Classico, period. You know, no disrespect, Chivas, um, I think that this game has always been meaningful. It's always been physical. It's always been nasty. I think that's what makes a rivalry a rivalry. And you really haven't had that with Chivas, you would say. But with, you know, because these teams have played actual games, they've played meaningful games one another on a consistent basis over the years, it's really brewed this kind of hatred among the fan bases. And I think the teams don't really care for each other as well. You know, I asked players this question and they said, you know, they don't like us and we don't like them. They know, we both know this. There's no, there's no love lost here. And I think that it's always going to be a scrappy game. It's never one game you can just overlook because you never know what you can get from the earthquakes. And the galaxy remember perfectly well what their last meeting went like. And it did not go well for them because they have the game seemingly in hand. It just kind of slipped through their fingers. So I don't think they're going to want to do that again, especially, especially because they want to try to create some distance between the middle of the pack and yeah. the front of the uh, Western Conference race if they're going to mount a challenge for the supporter shield. Well, and I said at the top of the show that I don't, I don't really... I know that that RSL's got a five point lead. Galaxy have two games in hand, though. Um, in, in my mind, Galaxy have to be considered the favorite uh, for MLS Cup, no matter what the records are, just based on the the last two years and and the talent they have on the roster. Uh, do you agree with that statement? I think you know, not not one hundred percent, but I think they definitely can be considered the favorite because they have the talent, they have the kind of cohesion. But I think. First off, they're going to need to show they can win, you know, they can close out games on a consistent basis and get points where they have to get points. And that starts against San Jose. They've also got a game against Chivas. They've got a game against D.C. United. So they've got to win those games. If they can prove they can win those games, if Keane and Donovan keep scoring, if they keep getting production from a guy like a Marcelo Sarvas, who in my opinion has been the team's MVP this season, I think there's no reason they can't mount a challenge. But You know, I think it's been a common saying around the Galaxy circles that this team has the talent to beat any team anywhere on any day. And I think that kind of trouncing of RSL really showed that because they were just able to kind of manhandle Salt Lake in a pretty quick fashion. Um, You know, I'm curious to see what a Seattle team looks like with a fully fit, fully sharp Clint Dempsey. I want to see what that looks like and what how they look, because I think that might be the only real question mark left in the Western Conference. LA knows they can beat Salt Lake, as Salt Lake knows they can beat LA. So I think it's going to be real fun, but we'll see what happens in the in the playoffs. It's I'm going to be great. I'm going to do some projection on on what you just said, and let me know if I'm if I'm on the right path. Because my next question was going to be, okay, well, if there if there are holes, if there are things to be exploited, what could they be? I, I reading between what you said, closing out games, but the bringing in of Pinedo, that kind of was the, okay, look, we're going to try to close things down at the back, uh, especially at the end of games, correct? Yeah, definitely. I think that not only that, but it, it, as I mentioned earlier in the show, that he is a kind of person who can have a little bit more confidence, have some confidence. You know, he's not afraid. He's willing to leave his box. He controls everything in that area. So that definitely helps. But, you know, up the field, you know, They've been a lot smarter just with the way they've kind of closed out games. They've ran to the corner flag. They haven't just gone searching for that goal, which has caught them on the counterattack. They've, you know, they've kind of delved into the dark arts a little bit, which is 
perfectly fine if you're going to be a winning team. Yeah. You know, sometimes you have to kind of close out games by running, kicking the ball out of the, out of bounds. And I think they know that because they've done that. They've struggled at times to just kind of finish out matches, and they don't want that to uh, come to bite them again. Now that you're in the thick of the playoff chase. So Beckham just shows up at practice, Adam. That's how that's how it rolls on your beat. Uh, yeah. I mean, I was surprised as anybody when I got up to practice this morning and I just saw, I was like, hey, there's only one guy with a number out and playing number 23. Huh. That's cool. Now, so <laughs> wait, does, does, the, does the club, does, does Beckham call up the club and say, hey, listen, I'm in town. I just want to get some, some work in. I'm coming out. Or does it just show up and go, hey, by the way, I'm going to train with you guys today? Um, I mean, I had some conversations with people, other people at the club and they said, you know, you just had a... He talked to Bruce Arena, said he was interested, and Bruce said, you're happy to have you, you know, because you were such a good steward to the club, and there he was. You know, I think people were really happy to see him. They they were just giddy. You know, Jaime Panetto yeah. talk, jokes about taking a picture with him. So it was just, uh, I think it was a fun time, you know. I think associate head coach Dave Sarek kind of put it best. He said, you know, seeing David was like a warm blanket. It was just so <laughs> comfortable and nice to see him, and, you know, it's, it's cool. You know, he even said hello to the journalist there. So it, you know, he's a nice guy. And uh, I would imagine you look like crap, right? Probably way out of shape. Didn't look good. Probably had a little trouble with uh, pinging some pe- some balls around, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you saw I put up a video on Instagram and uh, of him making a shot. And I was just like, hmm. There was a bunch of other shots I took before. But I was like, yeah, let's wait to see if he actually can make one. Uh, him in his old age and all. But, yeah. Yeah, he, he looked fit. He looked like he could still play if he was so inclined. LAGalaxyInsider.com is the website. If you want anything about Los Angeles Galaxy, that's the place to go. Adam Serrano, thank you so much. We appreciate you taking some time to hang with us on Pitch Pass. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Pitch Pass. This is your- For more show information, go to pitchpass.com.